my name is Elizabeth Yu, and I'm a cornea, cataract, and refractive surgeon at Virginia Eye Consultants in Norfolk, Virginia. The key visual needs and expectations of our patients after cataract surgery are one that we are able to achieve improved clarity of vision, of course. And if patients are looking for a certain level of uncorrected vision or less dependence on spectacles at the desired range, whether it's distance or near or distance and a range of up close vision, all of that needs to be nailed. But at the same time, we also have to provide a process where patients can have a very smooth, subjective recovery where they feel very comfortable and their vision settles in quickly. And so that these patients can have that same experience where it was kind of painless and patients see just like their relatives and their neighbors do as they will come in to our office and our clinics asking for certain types of vision and visual independence. With regards to patients' expectations, if they are looking for that level of spectacle independence, the patient conversation piece with regards to the benefits as well as the potential side effects are going to be extremely important. So setting those expectations up front with regards to what kind of positive dysphotopsias, whether it's starbursts or glare or rings around specific point sources of light at night that needs to be discussed on the front end, especially as it relates to the severity level. So I often tell my patients that 98% of patients will notice with diffractive presbyopia correcting lenses, some level of rings around point sources of light, such as street lamps or headlights, if they're looking at them directly. It is very different from what to expect with what they have with their current cataract scenario, where their vision while looking at specific light sources can completely shatter. It's more like a donut effect. So they can see through, but they will notice that ring around the light source. So patients expect that they should, by and large, have a 98% chance that they will fall into that mild or moderate level and only a 1% to 2% chance that this would be a more debilitating or severe level of that positive dysphotopsia. Now, I also do talk to my patients on the front end that if it is that they notice that it is hard for them to get used to, you know, a new watch on their wrist or the, the rims on a new pair of glasses, or if they've experienced floaters and those floaters are very disruptive to their vision and they may have a tendency to perseverate on that, that I will guide them away from those specific type of lenses. But it is important for us to explain to our patients that no matter what type of lens that they go with, their glare will reduce, but it may not go away completely. As we also know that all lenses, whether it's a monofocal all the way through diffractive light splitting lens technologies, they can have some level of glare. And then, of course, there is always the chance of that potential need for a touch up, particularly if they are looking for some spectacle freedom. So these patients who are more at risk for that would be those who have had LASIK or those patients who have short axial lengths or really myopic uh, axial links or those who have a higher level of astigmatism, all of these patients would be slightly at higher risk for needing that touch-up. So these are the expectations that I try to set on the front end that they have a great chance of being able to achieve the quality of vision and the objective uh, spectacle independence, if that is something they are looking for, because our current technologies, as well as our formulas for picking these lenses are so excellent. But at the same time, it is important to set those expectations on the front end. The current spectrum of lens technologies that we have available to us today are just truly a level above and something we've never been able to experience before, even with multifocality before. There are always 
bifocal, multifocals. And we often had to blend and mix different lens types, whether it was in EDOF with a multifocal or different ad powers of multifocals in order to help our patients achieve that spectacle corrective vision. And also, because of the lenses that we had in the past, there were a lot of eyes that we could not serve simply because the type of lenses that we had could not provide uh, spectacle independence because there were only light splitting. It is so exciting today that the solutions for less dependence on spectacles has become so expansive and also able to serve a much greater level of patients between our trifocals, which make it truly very, very simple. And it really does provide that excellent distance quality of vision, as well as intermediate optimized at 60 centimeters and near at 40 centimeters. These are really optimal lengths without real divots of uh, vision in between those. Even though it is a trifocal, there is a true nice continuous range of vision with that lens. And also with the actual hybrid lenses, I like to call it an enhanced trifocal. It does provide that great blend and uh, range of vision, com uh, completing the extended depth of focus for the distance through intermediate and having the near. What that lens does help me is for those patients who have visual needs, particularly closer than 40 centimeters, or for those patients who who have that need for more that far intermediate vision. So let's say a person who's using multiple screens and need the length of vision that's a little bit further than just the arm's length away because they are looking at multiple screens, that lens and that hybrid EDOF multifocal allows me to provide that. And for those patients who may not want a diffractive multifocal type of lens technology for presbyopia correction, or their eyes have comorbidities that just don't allow them to, it's great that we have these enhanced monofocal lenses. It just gives them an extra oomph so they can have that distance through the far intermediate. So I don't have to explain to women that they won't be able to see themselves in the mirror for cosmetic purposes or or I don't have to explain that the dashboard length is not available to them. And it's so nice that we have this large array of lenses to help our patients' needs today. There has been great evidence in peer review literature that certainly demonstrates that having trifocal lenses as well as hybrid EDOF multifocal lenses provide more range of vision. And that's certainly been established. The one thing that I will absolutely agree with is that because there is a little bit more light splitting, even though there is more light utilization uh, of these lens platforms, the photic phenomenon is a little greater than let's say just a non-diffractive EDOF or prior low ad multifocals. So I do experience maybe a little more awareness from my patients that there is some greater glare around lights, but it always certainly still does uh, sit within the, um, I'd say 98% of my patients still only experience a mild to moderate level. I have yet to experience more than 1% to 2% of patients that have a more severe complaint of that, but absolutely, with greater splitting of light, we will see a little more photic phenomenon. There are so many lenses now within the uh, diffractive multifocal lens class, uh, presbyopia correcting lenses with the EDOF class expanding, as well as even monofocals having that greater, just slighter range of vision. So it's exciting to see that we have such an expanse of lenses. And it's great because, for example, for my moderate myo patients, who these are the patients who naturally are able to see up close without glasses. And I 
don't have to explain to them that they're going to have to change their arm length to find their sweet spot. Wherever they normally read is where they'll be able to read. And that discussion no longer needs to be had. And it really simplifies the patient chair discussion. Just recently approved is the small aperture IOL. And that is really exciting for a number of reasons, but with the small aperture, it is going to provide that range of vision. As an investigator in the study, I was able to appreciate that patients were able to, um, in the non-dominant eye, have that nice near vision offset to about a minus 50 or minus 75 in the non-dominant eye. With that being said, it also can neutralize or help patients with astigmatism upwards of 1.5 diopters without compromise of their vision, and that was in my clinical experience. And lastly, it'll be interesting to see what small aperture technology can do for those who have more aberrated or irregular corneas. And then lastly, it is exciting to see that in our monofocal lenses, they are adding more lenses that have just a little extra higher order aberration um, that's being manipulated right within the center in order to provide just an extra boost of range of vision. The patient selection and that patient chair time is so important when we are discussing and kind of figuring out what lens technology is right for them. So obviously it is a combination of the objective data combined with the patient's subjective desires, needs, and of course, taking into consideration, for me, it's important, is their financial scenario. So with regards to the objective data, I always want to make sure that I understand what the patient's ocular comorbidities are, as well as what their level of astigmatism looks like and the quality of the imaging that I was able to take on the diagnostic side. So we know that dry eye disease or ocular surface disease is rampant, upwards of 80% of those patients who are coming in in that cataract surgery aged population. So looking at that objective placido disc uh, topography, looking at the Myers and the axial maps to identify the quality of the astigmatism combined with the quantity of the astigmatism as verified by both the topo, maybe tomography, looking at the biometry, it's important that we have consistency in the magnitude as well as the axis or the meridian of their astigmatism. If it doesn't look right or if there's a lot of discrepancy, I know this patient is dry. And that already alerts me to Oh, do I need to consider or rule out certain types of diffractive lenses or light splitting lenses? And it really, that is going to have to be combined with the patient's desire for uh, their level of spectacle independence, as well as are they willing to be more aggressive with potential dry eye disease management, even after surgery, in order to keep their vision stable. Also, we have to take other ocular morbidities into consideration like macular pathology, retinopathy, or other corneal diseases. And then once I gather this information, we need to combine it with the patient's specific characteristics. And those patient-centered considerations include their profession, their hobbies, um, their aversion to potential lens exchanges or uh, enhancements, or if they are okay with uh, having the side effect profile of maybe some glare and halos at night. But putting this together, it is a little bit of chair time, but once we get used to it and get experience with our advanced technologies today, they are just so good. And there's something that can provide a range of vision for just about every patient beyond those patients who just do not have the ability to have a good spectacle corrected visual outcome, we do have the ability now to provide and offer our patients a much greater range of vision and much simpler solutions to achieve that today more than ever.
Hi, my name is Jennifer Lowe, and I'm an ophthalmologist practicing in Miami, Florida, and I do have a focus on cataract and refractive surgery. IOL selection is one of the most important factors that, as surgeons, we need to consider when preparing our patients for surgery. Because nowadays, cataract surgery is not simply just removing the cataract. It's also become a refractive procedure. Patients want not only to see better, but they also want to see better typically without glasses or contact lenses. So it's become imperative that as surgeons and clinicians, that we assess patients in depth prior to surgery. I think one of the most important factors that has been shown, uh, even in the FACO study by Bill Trattler, is that, and also by Priya Gupta, she also performed her own study looking at the ocular surface as well. Um, there is so much importance placed on the ocular surface, meaning typically dry eye. Many patients do not are not aware that they have symptoms of dry eye. In fact, they may not feel dry, as we know. But dry eye can extremely um, impact the, the measurements that we take ahead of time, such as keratometry and biometry. And henceforth, this will affect the IOL calculations that surgeons are, are performing. And it may lead us to pick a lens that yields a refractive surprise. So I take lots of effort with my patients ahead of time to assess their ocular surface. I'll often perform multiple repeat measurements of topography, keratometry, and biometry. I'll often start my patients on treatments in order to improve the ocular surface because we also know that if we aren't treating the ocular surface ahead of time, after the surgery, they will often feel drier and look to you as the clinician and surgeon as to why this has happened. So I think time spent counseling in advance is imperative, not only for patient understanding, but also for improved patient outcomes. As we know from the studies that I mentioned, the corneal surface, if it's affected by dry eye, can actually show us a false or an induce an astigmatism that may not really be there, or it could even mask an astigmatism that, that is there. So if we have these um, poor scans, poor quality scans due to ocular surface dryness, again, we may be choosing the in incorrect lens power for the patient. Uh, so especially when you're dealing with uh, things like a corneal astigmatism or presbyopic correcting IOLs, you really, really want to make sure that uh, your corneal surface is as pristine as possible. Um, other topics to think about too, in terms of choosing um, the the you know, or in terms of assessing preoperative health of the patient's eye beyond the ocular surface, of course, would be to think also about the retina. We want to make sure that there's no subtle epiretinal membrane or macular pucker present, and also look for other comorbidities such as macular degeneration and even glaucoma. So it is very important to have a full. Uh, comprehensive exam on the patient and perform proper counseling ahead of time. Yes, many of our patients nowadays have had prior refractive surgery. And not only can this affect our calculations and determinations of which IOL to select, but we also know that these patients a lot of times have higher expectations regarding their refractive outcome. There are already refractive patients, so they have a good understanding of what eye surgery can do, and they typically want the best results. Um, so as we know, any refractive surgery has changed the shape of the cornea, even LASIK or PRK. And you know, with myopic LASIK or PRK, we've induced a flattening of the ocular surface. And with hyperopic PRK or LASIK, we've induced a steepening. And so this needs to be taken into account when performing the IOL calculations. We are very lucky now because we have wonderful advanced formulas for calculating the IOLs. And we also have improved technology for measuring the um, axial length and keratometry, including swept source OCT. So we do have a lot more technology at our at our disposal that has vastly improved our outcomes after refractive surgery. But it's very important for the surgeon and the 
the technicians to catch the fact that the patient has had prior LASIK. So always important to take a detailed history and extremely important to look at the topography because patients often may forget to let you know that they've had surgery. Some of them don't even think that their refractive surgery was surgery. So I do put a big emphasis on always checking the topography and always asking the patient. Um, again, luckily with the newer advanced formula, such as the Barrett formula, the Hill RBF, and the Kane formula, we do have um, much better outcomes now after refractive surgery, and we are not as reliant on the, as such, such, such things as the historic method. Prior RK surgery, for example, is even trickier in many respects. And you also have to worry about patients that possibly have other uh, corneal conditions such as ectasia or keratoconus. So when it comes to these patients, extra consideration has to be made um, to how you might adjust the lens uh, with patients with prior RK and, and things like keratoconus or ectasia. We definitely usually, or we recommend typically to pick a more myopic target because you just don't know what the outcome will be. Uh, it's, it's much less accurate. So very important um, not only to use the advanced formulas, use the best testing and diagnostics that you have, but I think another key is to always counsel the patient preoperatively. They have to have a really good understanding of what they're getting into. And I also counsel my patients, even the LASIK patients, that there is a margin of error really for any surgery. But when they've had prior corneal surgery, the margin of error is higher and we could experience a refractive surprise, which again could require the patient to have further corneal refractive surgery or even possibly an IOL exchange. So again, being on the same team with the patient, talking to them ahead of time, I think is extremely important. And then using the most advanced technology you have available and the most advanced uh, formulas you have available is extremely important. Uh, one other new technology that's really been um, a huge help in our, our, our world now has been the light adjustable lens. And that for the first time is allowing us to actually make adjustments on patients' refractive outcome after the surgery. So I do always like to bring up this incredible new technology to my patients that have had prior corneal surgery because, again, since the margin of error or the, the chance of a refractive surprise is increased in these patients, it's nice to have an option where we could more easily adjust their prescription afterwards. So in addition to looking at a patient's ocular surface, we always want to check the overall health of the eye. I'm always looking out for things like glaucoma or macular degeneration. Glaucoma, of course, can reduce the patient's contrast sensitivity and also inhibit their field of vision. And so this needs to be taken into consideration when advising or selecting enhanced uh, intraocular lens implants, such as multifocals or presbyopic lenses. Of course, age-related macular degeneration affects the fovea and the macula. And again, there would be, you know, relative contraindications to, you know, placing a presbyopic lens in a patient um, with these conditions. So again, very important to educate the patients, identify the problem, and work with them together to pick the best IOL selection. Um, if someone has an epiretinal membrane or some type of retinal pathology, I also often like to involve a retina specialist so the patient has a better understanding of everything that they um, might experience after the surgery. And again, preoperative counseling is very important. And I like to err on the side of caution and, and just make sure my patients are aware of possible contraindications to certain lenses. I think one of the biggest, most important items to discuss in your preoperative counseling when you meet a cataract patient is how they want to see. We may think we know how the patient wants to see, but I've often found that I'm wrong. And the best, most simplest way to find out is just to ask the patient. There are many questionnaires you can use that have, have shown to be very helpful, um, but I actually um, uh, employ a, a simple technique where I ask the patient, number one, what do you wear glasses for currently? Because I found that that way you can actually catch the patients that take off their glasses to read. And one of the biggest mistakes a person can make as a surgeon is to assume that a patient 
already understands the concept of wearing reading glasses after surgery um, if you're planning to place a monofocal IOL with a refractive target for distance. So one of the biggest pearls I picked up from another colleague was just simply ask them, do you take your glasses off to read? I found that this really cuts to the chase and gets to the point of what the patient's doing. And they'll and if they tell me, oh yeah, I always take my glasses off to read, that gives me the biggest clue on what they're used to wearing their glasses for uh, and, and what they may or may not be happy with after surgery. So again, just talking to the patient and asking them what they wear their glasses for. And then as as a, a dovetail question of that, I often say, what do you want to wear your glasses for after surgery? Or what do you not want to wear them for? And this gives me a really good idea of what they're willing to accept or what they want to achieve. Um, then once I figured out what they want, I will talk to them about the different options. And I do always mention the possibility of post-operative photic phenomena, such as halo and glares um, with certain lenses. And I, I do like to really emphasize that. I often emphasize that most patients do adapt really well to this, but there can be a certain percentage of patients that don't. Another question that I often like to ask is how much they like to drive at night versus how much they perform activities up close. At near. Again, I'm looking for you know differences in lifestyle to see if someone is more of a night driver. Maybe we want to avoid a lens that could give them halo and glares and stick to more of an extended depth of focus. Or as a person, you know, constantly reading, um, doing near work, but not actually driving much, we may want to stick with a lens that is giving us more near, um, even at a possibility of having some halos. So again, uh, surveys can work really, really well. But I think also just asking the patient, spending a few minutes getting to know them and just finding out actually currently what they wear their glasses for and what they what they're okay with wearing in the future just can really get to the heart of the matter. So my best practice for speaking to patients and educating them about the different lenses is I like to spend several minutes, of course, in the exam lane speaking to the patients. After I've reviewed their scans, then I give them a summary of the different IOL options that I think is best for them. Also, in my exam lane, I do have several posters and handouts that describe the different types of IOLs. And patients, I find, are often reviewing the, this before I come into the room, which is actually very helpful. At the end of the visit, I also give them literature handouts about the lenses so they can take that home to read with their friends and family. And then I also have been using these uh, educational videos um, that patients can actually scan with their phone. It's a QR code, and it provides a link to a professionally made video that the patients can watch that shows the different types of lenses, the different educations that they might need to learn more about the lenses, and it has beautiful animations. And again, I think this is also a great resource for patients because they can show their family and friends and take time to learn about it. Oftentimes, if a patient has questions, I'll perform a follow-up call or a telehealth visit with them afterwards, again, simply to answer the questions because we have so many options and it's really important that the patients understand. 